Hello and welcome to another Profound Experience of Poetry. My name is Lucy and I am the editor of Profound Experience and uh, Shabby Dollhouse. And I'm doing this thing where I have conversations with people that I want to talk to just for fun. Um, because I can, I guess. Um, and today I'm talking to lapsed librarian, Matt Nelson. Um, <laughs> Matt, would you want to introduce yourself? Hi, I'm Matt. Um, I am a teacher in Portland, Oregon, but in a past life, I was a librarian um, in a few different ways. And I'm really thankful to talk with you today, Lucy. Oh, you don't have to be thankful. <laughs> um, but I'm thankful also, I suppose. Um, I wanted, yeah, it's interesting this, I guess I should say like part of why I wanted to talk to you is because I'm interested in talking with people related to the profound experience of poetry book club, which you are in, um, and also just poets in general, but I especially wanted to talk with you because I think that like you, by, through being a librarian, um, have contributed something to like literary culture or the literary culture that I've been in, in, in a way that like a lot of other people haven't. It's quite a, uh, quite a unique or specific um, role to play. Um, but I guess, first of all, I would like to ask you about your relationship with reading and like, when do, when do you remember that becoming an important thing in your life? I think um, that's an interesting question of the like first book question. I think I read when I was really young. Um, I, I remember reading, or I remember going to the library a lot. I, we used to live in, where I grew up in West Seattle and we'd go to the Southwest library. And I remember we would uh, drive, before I was old enough to walk, before I was old enough to, to bike. But I remember there would be um, like summer reading contests where you would compete with other kids in the neighborhood to see how many books you could read. And you would, if you were in the top five, you'd go to some, um, some like pancake breakfast with the like Seattle's librarian or something. Um, and I never won. I think I would always be really uh, into the um, the items that you get. Like you'd get like this fold out with stickers, or, or I think you when you return books, the librarian would ask you, "Did you read this?" And then they'd give you a sticker to put in the pamphlet, and then you would have like a completed pamphlet at some point. Um, and so I wanted like all that stuff, kind of like in the same way, like I, I was really into like the McDonald's Monopoly stuff where you get those little sticker. Anyways, um, and so there was, there was always this interest in reading almost, and this is not a great part of reading, but uh, almost as like a competition or like a way to like add value to myself is like, if I read a lot, I'll be a good person or like an interesting person. And so like those two things I think were connected at an early age and have shifted in different ways, but, um, there's still something basic about the need to read in order to truthfully or untruthfully connect with other folks um, as it as it for like gives itself like a kind of like an an outside body which like two people can look at at the same time um, this is like way off <laughs> of what your question was but I'd say I, I yeah I started reading. <laughs> Not like a, a super early age, but I, I definitely wanted to read a lot at an early age. Um, and did that continue like as you were a teen and like, you know, sort of early adulthood and stuff? Yeah, I, I always liked reading in high school. And I think like the first, 
author I wanted to like complete their canon was was Stephen King because my dad really liked Stephen King. Um, he really yeah. So he my dad like would would read like I remember him reading to my brother and I um, like Lord of the Rings when we'd go camping, and and so there would be like he definitely was always reading like a sci-fi or horror or fantasy novel and and that like definitely appealed to me at an early age but then probably around high school I was like I need to read the classics and like really round out my my literature uh shelf um and then in college it was just fun to like see newer stuff but that's like right after college is when I realized like that newer stuff like modern American literature it wasn't really that modern or 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 like groundbreaking in as it related to me in the present moment um but uh I've always like felt comfortable surrounded by books like I worked at a Seattle libraries when I was in college and um my family would often go to like a borders like a big box bookstore on the weekends um, and so we'd always be like rotating books and so there's like a level of comfort that they represent to me and so what about writing because like at, at what point did you think oh maybe I can write something too well college was like a really difficult time and <laughs> uh, probably like the third or fourth major I was trying to do was creative writing. And I ended up in a short story writing class with this graduate student teaching and he was just like excellent and encouraging. Um, uh, and that was one of the first places where I saw like newer writing, um, like George Saunders and Laurie Moore, like just people I'd never heard of before. Um, and it was really interesting, it just seemed like things were possible. And that's when I wanted to become like a writer. Uh, I didn't get into the creative writing program as an undergrad, which should have been just like super easy <laughs> to get into, but they, uh, they didn't, they, that one didn't take. But um, yeah, it, it was definitely in college where like the creative aspect or like the the storytelling aspect came in, but I, re I remember like my grandma at a very early age would say like, keep a diary, you'll wanna remember things. And I think off and on, I would have a journal or a diary that I would write in. Um, and I thought writing essays were, were always kind of fun. Like I never actually had like a, uh, I'm not very good at writing essays, but like I find like I can get pretty creative in them, which doesn't, again, lend itself to like someone grading an essay on the Scarlet Letter, but like it still felt fun in a way. Um, yeah, so it, it was a bit late or not that late, but it felt late. It's, I, I, don't, I, I don't think that sounds late at all. <laughs> I don't know like how, how much earlier can you get into it? Like when you're like 12? <laughs> But, yeah. uh, <laughs> but um, yeah, like what, um, but, and then did you always have like an awareness of like poetry or when did that come in? Cause I feel like now I would, I don't know. I, I guess I would can think of you as a poet, but what do you think of, do you think of yourself like that? Uh, no, I, th I like think yeah. I write probably more poetry <laughs> or I have in the past five years than I have fiction, but I just think I try to write. I don't, I, yeah, I don't really think of myself as a poet or like a short story writer or a novelist, just just writing. Yeah. Um, but poetry again, also college, but I remember my parents in high school got me, they like went to Borders, which was great because they had all the media there. And I think they actually asked someone and they, they brought home Bright Eyes, Fevers and Mirrors and <laughs> a Billy Collins poetry book. And uh, 
I learned later about like a general distaste for for such pop poetry, but um, I remember being a little bit awakened to to different possibilities. I think that's like the whole thing is there's usually like an idea that poetry is this one thing, and then you find out that it's not, or, or a novel or or like a short story. Like there's there's so many more examples out there, which I think is again like coming into the the librarian side where it's like I love showing someone or like suggesting like look at this book this book is really cool and maybe not what you expected or have seen before um but poetry yeah poetry didn't come till later yeah uh, yeah and and when you were like Sorry if this is, I don't know if it's weird that I'm asking you all these questions about when you were a teenager, but <laughs> I'm, I'm interested. Um, like, was it like, if you're reading, if you're like, I'm going to read the classics, like, did you know other people who were doing stuff like that? Or was that kind of weird? Because <laughs> I didn't know yeah, anyone who was doing that. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that was, that was weird. I didn't really consider it weird. I think I just mm. considered it uh, my own. Like, a lot of my friends in high school were more, um, let's just say I got into more trouble with them than I would alone. And that was good in many ways. Um, it like definitely pushed me and pulled me into a different sphere of experiences, but um, the reading was my own. Like that, I didn't really share that with other folks. Um, I mean, my dad, I could talk to, if we had read like the same book, like like it, after I read Ender's Game or something, I could talk to him about it. Um, but no one else was like trying to read the Metamorphosis uh, when they were sixteen. But I didn't. I didn't think like that was weird. I just thought that this is what I wanted to do. Well, that's amazing. I'm glad that you didn't feel that it was weird. I'm sorry <laughs> if I make you feel that now. <laughs> no, no, no. no. Um, so I guess so. So you so you started writing when in like a creative writing class in college. But then how did you end up going to New York and like? Because I met you at the library that you eventually started in New York. But how did you like get there? What what happened and why did you go there and all that? Um, so I went to New York because I went to Queens College to do an MFA program for fiction, but it was, that was like the third year I applied to different MFA programs. Um, and on that third go round, Queens was like, I don't know if the, if they would accept anyone, but they definitely like, I mean, it felt really good to get accepted. And I think that they were a, a pretty new program um, and a cheaper program. Um, and I liked, like there are reasons why I chose it. They, they had studio time and literature courses required to graduate. And it obviously was in New York. So like there were plenty of good reasons to go. But I, I think, because of those undergraduate classes, I felt like writing was something that I could do or something that I really enjoyed. And uh, I wanted to do it more. And it seemed like you could do it for free. Like if you got into a good enough school, uh, which was very appealing to me. Um, but uh, yeah, I was, I kind of like, was stuck in Seattle or, or felt like I was stuck in Seattle. I kept like trying to apply, like I applied before I graduated and then I applied the year after that. And I was, um, I think I was encouraged because there was this place that I, that was there in, in Capitol Hill called Pilot Books. Um, and that's like the genesis of so much of my trajectory. Um, it was run by this person named Summer Robinson. And I remember reading about it 
in the Seattle Stranger, but it was a small press only bookstore. Um, and it was, it was upstairs in this little mall on Broadway across from a taco place and a tattoo parlor. And it was just like, the coolest people were there, the coolest looking books, books I've never heard of before. Um, I started doing, they had like a, uh, a writing group. I would, I, I joined that and I was living on the hill at that time. So it was like, just a, like a meeting place. And I met like all of my friends through there. Like, um, yeah, like my Seattle literary scene really had its locus at, at Pilot Books. And, and to me, it was just like what I wanted to be. A, I wanted to be a person who could contribute a book to a place like that and have other weirdos in like want to read that or at least like see it. Um, I remember like one of the, the biggest highlights of my life at that time was I was making a zine with my friend Victoria Wolf and we had our last issue release at Pilot Books and I thought that was like the crest of my of my life. Um, yeah, it just felt like a like a there's a there's another bookstore called the third place books in Seattle. There's a few of them in Seattle, but uh, it's a used and new bookstore. And that, but the concept of third place is like you have your your home, you have your work, and then you need like a third place, like some sort of meeting place uh, or like community place. And Pilot Books was that for me, and I that 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 community feeling really stuck. Um, I just thought like this, this is the coolest thing is, I mean, it was also super like, I mean, I'm friends with Summer and or I, I like became friends with Summer and, and I got to know more of the like, the daily grind of even the spectacular thing where you just sit in a hot room uh, and no one shows up for, for hours or days. And it's, it can be very lonely and even uh, even in the company of books, you can feel bored at, at points. So like, I got to see like the glamor and the, the kind of gutter. But even though you had this and you said you met all your friends there and stuff like, but you still said you felt trapped in Seattle. So like what, what was going on? <laughs> yeah, I think, I think I felt like kind of, I felt uh, not unfairly denied, but uh, a little chip on my shoulder against UW, which was where I went to undergraduate, undergraduate, and like I didn't want to go to their MFA program because I was like, "Fuck them!" Like they didn't want me for undergrad; they're not going to have me for graduate. Little did I know, like I wasn't very good, so like <laughs> there wasn't like I wasn't going to get in <laughs> anyway. But. Um, I still had it in my mind that like I, I didn't want to go there. And I also, something that was different uh, about my like shifting life at that time was, was the preponderance, preponderance, the like the, the overwhelming majority of the friends I was making were not from Seattle. And to me in my head, I was like, oh, people move. Um, cause I, I had just, and I, and I really enjoyed, there's a term that someone came up with for like Seattleites that, that have been born in Seattle. They're, they're called Mossbacks or at least some journalist one time called them that. And so I was really proud in one way that I, I like grew up in Seattle, went to high school in Seattle, went to college in Seattle. And like, I was a Seattle person, but all my friends were like from all over the place and had all these other experiences. And, um, were the same age as me, but doing this thing that I thought was uh, difficult, even though I knew that like all the London's Roman or whatever the, the coming of age stories were like included, a, like a key part of that story is you have to leave home and you have to like 
go journey. Um, and so that romance of, of, of like traveling or, or shifting or, or um, finding a new home was becoming more a part of how I was viewing my time in Seattle. And so, yeah, I wasn't stuck. I like had a great friends. Um, I even had ideas of like going back to Seattle right after New York. Um, and so like, this is, this is not often, I don't, I, I think I've said this before, but um, Summer and I were gonna start something like Mellow Pages in Seattle. We were gonna call it like, I think the silent library or, no, 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 there's a different name for it, but we were, she and I were gonna start a small press archive and library in Seattle um, after I was done with school. And then I, we just started it in New York and it kind of took off. But yeah, um, Seattle wasn't in no ways like stifling, but I felt like I was stifled. No, I understand. Like you feel like you have to go away to to be able to look back on it or something. Like I think, I don't know. Everybody or a lot of people have that feeling that you have to leave because I don't know. Do you feel like it changed you or like allowed you to be like some other version of yourself when you left, or were you, did you feel like you were, you were the same? Yeah, I think. I don't know if it it actually changed me, but it it definitely allowed for more change. Like I don't I don't know if you can. Yeah. I definitely experienced more things which can kind of enact change, but I think I also saw more things and were were um, in contact with with different perspectives in a way that I wasn't in Seattle. Um, and I had to hustle more in New York, which is like a, a different way of living than I was used to in, in Seattle. So I like, yeah, I think it just expanded what I had in many ways, but also probably allowed for more change to happen later. Yeah. So I guess we should talk about Mellow Pages because we're kind of like, kind of talking about it without really getting there um but maybe you could like explain what it what it was um mellow pages was a big experiment that seemed to some things happened some things worked some things didn't but it was it was a community uh small press library that was premised on the idea that you could become a member by lending your books to the library. So it's kind of like a reverse library and then a real library. Um, but what actually happened in the space was like a lot of readings, a lot of events, a lot of people meeting each other um, and becoming friends or partners or spouses in the future. Um, but it's, um, yeah, it was, it was a, it was a space in a building that uh, was pretty open or, or we tried to make it as most as open as we could um, to people and to books. Like there's a lot of books that I had never heard of before and a lot of presses and it just felt like a way to like kind of boost these things, these, these objects that need other hands to hold up to the light sometimes um, or are definitely helped when other people are shining light. I think that's a mixed metaphor, but um, yeah, it was, it was a, it was a thing that Jacob Perkins and I did uh, for, for as long as we could. And um, yeah, it was, that definitely changed my life in some ways. How did it start? I remember it was it was a birthday, like the the original story. I think I really wanted tater tots, and um, 
for some reason, I, I was convinced to go to Greenpoint, which is maybe like where Karina was living at the time and maybe some good tater tots were at the time. Anyway, so a bunch of us went looking for tater tots in Greenpoint. And I like, I at the time I also really wanted to start a, a zine of my friend's work. Cause I've been trying to do different um, artistic stuff outside of school. Like Jacob and I used to do these things called 50 fifties. And I'd made one zine sort of that culminated in a reading um, but I wanted to do something a little more consistent. And um, so we were out and trying to make up names for it. And someone suggested, uh, Joe Wayne suggested Mellow Pages. And so at that point we had a name. And I think at that time there was maybe some snowstorms happening my birthdays in January and Jacob had just gone to Durham to pick up his brother's PhD in philosophy books. So he had this awesome collection of, of theory. Um, again, these kind of rare books that are expensive that people don't have access to, or like a maybe a public library wouldn't, wouldn't choose to have because maybe most people aren't like looking for Lauren Berlant or some, I don't know some name drop, whatever. And Jacob had just a ton of books and I, I had a healthy amount of books and um, like we knew people with books, like uh, at that time, John Larson had moved to New York and he had a bunch of books and Karina had a bunch of books. Uh, my, my roommate, Will Jameson had a bunch of books and it just seemed like we could create something. Uh, and Jacob already had a studio. He was using, he had, he had this art studio at 56 Bogart, this really tiny like closet. Um, but, he's, but he was just like, why don't we try to do this here? Right now we have all these books. There was like, there was kind of like, um, I guess, like a camel's hair breaking with, but in a good way where he had like, just a car full of books. And I mean, I think that's like how, I, I know that's how like Molasses book started. He, he got like this really great, huge estate of books. And, and it was like, oh, okay, now I can, doesn't matter. Anyway, the, there's a big influx of books. We already had a lot of books combined and then we just put them on a wall and then like started I think it was, I mean, it just felt like fun. It was like, I started a lot of Facebook messages to either authors that I already knew through Pilot or presses that I knew of. And I think AWP was just starting and, or it was about to happen in February. I think it was, this one was in Boston. And we, I don't know if we had even opened yet, but it was just an idea. And so I went to like the tables and asked different small press publishers, would you mind donating a book or two to this thing that we're trying to do? And um, I remember a lot of people being super generous and they gave us books and, and, and it's just exciting to have like brand new books uh, and to be able to offer them to people who are interested in the books. And I think like at that time, there was a big overlap of, of people who are interested in, in small press or, or alternative books and the internet. And a lot of authors lived on the internet and were friends with other authors on the internet. And so um, to have access to like a Baltimore author's book in Brooklyn, doesn't seem like that hard of a thing to do, but um, it is kind of, and I mean, it was really easy for us. We didn't have to do very much work. We just had to like keep the doors open, but um, making that connection between a publisher or an author and like a reader was, 
I don't know. It was fun and it, it like it it filled a need at the time because it it people were interested. Like people became like into it, I guess. Yeah, like I remember the first time I went there and like seeing so many of this because like, seeing so many of the books that had just come out that I like wanted to read, but I feel like when you're like looking at your computer and you're like I have to order these from all different websites and it like costs a lot of money and shipping and like I don't even know if I'm gonna like it or whatever you're kind of just like overwhelmed and you maybe have one but then suddenly like you would see like all of these things together and it was like oh my god like this stuff like it makes it look and feel important right like mm -hmm. like wow like there's a place for this like uh it's not just in my screen or like on my shelf with my small collection or whatever mm -hmm. um so yeah, I feel like, and also just that it was like this sort of, to me, I guess you'd already see, like seen something like this in Seattle with pilot books. But like, for me, I was like, oh my God, I've never, I did, like, didn't know this could be a thing. Like I've never heard of anything like this before. Mm. Um, but I think that part of what you said about like trying to be open and welcoming to everyone was like, sort of the like what made it so like what made it work because it like it didn't matter who came in you were just like treated everybody the same and were like really uh just like I don't know it I felt like anyone was welcome and because of that like quite it took off fast right like it was like you'd only been open like a few weeks or something and then like all these different like people were writing about it and you had like a thing in the New York Times about it and it was just like you were still basically just in a like art closet. Yeah <laughs> it, it was just a closet. It, maybe it was just like a dull time in the in the news cycle there wasn't a lot happening but it did seem to get a lot of play quickly why do you yeah it, why why would why were people so excited excited about it <laughs> like I know like why I was but like it doesn't seem like I don't know like you were just like yeah we can do this it's not that difficult but then other people are like oh my god people some people did something yeah yeah yeah, yeah. I mean I think that's that's the case with anything that you do if you are public about it like I remember going to a cafe with Jacob to make zines one time like we were I, I took everyone's writing and like uh shrunk it down and we were we like we're using mass market paperback like just trashy mysteries and like pasting the stories at different points inside of the, these these paperbacks and just I mean we took over a big table we're like we got scissors we got glue and and just the the very fact of of making something like people would come over and be like what are you doing like how what is that are you gonna have a reading like it just action creates a reaction maybe and um it's I it's funny how often I found that to be true. If you do something in 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 the uh, the visibility line of of others, it creates some sort of attraction. And and so, even though anyone could have done what we did, just the fact of doing it will attract some sort of people. And um, that accounts for for some people. But like I think there was a lot of luck. Um, Bushwick at the time was like definitely going through uh, like maybe it's second or third phase of gentrification, but the area that we were in the Morgan stop was still pretty like the artistic community was still pretty tight knit. And so the building Mellow Pages was in 56 Bogart was like mostly just art studios uh with and galleries and some of them were relatively big and i don't know how jacob even got on the main floor but um i open 
gallery night, I don't even remember what night it was, you'd have people just wandering around. Uh, and I think like a bartender at Kings County had come through the Thursday and told her brother who happened to be a writer at New York Times about it and he liked books. And so he came the next week and it was just like, um, not really anyone's fault, I guess, but just uh, a weird, a weird alignment of Stonehenge where like the, the stars kind of poke through the, the third structure on your left. I don't know, it just, it seemed, um, it seemed unbelievable for sure. Like it felt very like, what is going on? Uh, and there are many times where Jacob and I were just like flush with, with like disbelief, which would turn into just like laughter at, uh, at each other. And, and um, yeah, it, it felt, it felt good. Like it felt like, it felt good and it felt um, exciting. Um, and they would go away like that feeling mm. and having those kind of bumps in, in the, in the serotonin influx would, would always be like supplemented by just having people in the space. Like that was cool to have that article and it was meaningful. It felt, or at least it, it felt meaningful. It felt like never in my life would I think that this was possible. But then it would also be like quickly, oh, here's this person who's never been here before. Let's give them the spiel. Let's show them some books. Um, that also had its own like hit in a way. Yeah. How did you feel about like, I mean, it's not like you were, it's not like you were being like famous or something, but you were very, you had to be very public for like, the time that you were doing it like you always were like hi welcome in this place and like let me like you know that in person and then also online like which was probably something that you hadn't really done before like how did that feel for you um I mean I think I'm generally like introverted and shy and um in some ways it felt like a key into the New York literary scene because I'd been in New York for two years and been going to like readings every week, if not every day. And like being shy is not helpful sometimes to, to like meeting people, um, especially if you're like going solo. I remember going to like the New York lit crawl by myself and just being feeling so shitty and like small and, um, just being, feeling like scared to talk to people, but then also feeling like the flip side of being like, oh, this is just a click. I, all these people just hang out with each other. They just like each other. Um, I'll never be able to enter, like kind of victimizing myself in, in, in terms of this, these social relations. And I don't like, uh, I, don't, I don't think that's, the way things were I, I definitely think that that like people are attracted to people doing things and so if you have a book you've done something you're doing something and people are like oh let me talk to you um, and if you don't have a book you're just a grad student and you're not doing anything you're just like really interested in books yeah. that's a that's the more intangible um energy and and it's it can be whether that's good or bad, uh, a blockage or or a lock to to like connecting. And I felt with Mellow Pages, it really like opened up all these people. Like suddenly I could talk to this author, or um, suddenly this press was asking to have their books in, or um, this other venue in in New York was like asking about things and and it, it also bolstered my own confidence like I would I was suddenly like able to to do that it wasn't just like 
the lock was on the outside. It was also on the inside in a way. And I felt more confident to be able to talk to people in the community. Um, and so like, it felt, it felt good. Uh, it also felt like bad. Like when we, we would mess up, like, and you, and it was a big mess up, it would feel bad. Um, and I never experienced that kind of public hurt, which is something that happens to a ton of people on the internet all the time, uh, especially not white men. Like, uh, so like the idea of trolling in the sense of like Lindy West, I, I didn't have to experience um, based a lot of my privilege, but I, like I'd, I would get like, like with the uh, Exxon stuff, like we would get some, <laughs> some of the, the, the bad press as you might call it. Maybe you can just uh, briefly explain that because it that, that sounds weird to have context. <laughs> yeah, um, so I think we might have been in like the second year and we're running out of steam very quickly. And I think we had done uh, Indiegogo to try and raise funds for the year for our rent. Um, and it had, it, had done, it had done really well and we had wanted more. And I think we were just feeling like super, and this is so like, so blatantly like male entitled, but it, it felt like we were not thanked for all the service we were doing or like um, not thanked in, in terms of like, there was no thanks. There was, there was plenty of people who were thankful for, for Mellow Pages and um, and maybe this is tied into that, to that media saturation at the beginning of like feeling new. But um, and I, I'm going to stop speaking for we, as in Jacob and I. I'm just going to say for me, yeah. um, it was. I think I I had maybe graduated. Yeah, I definitely graduated from my MFA program, and I was working full time. And I felt like fucking depleted every day because I'd work and then go to Mellow Pages, work and then go to Mellow Pages. And then the weekend would be at Mellow Pages. And it was just, it was a lot. And um, there was a weird part of it of like wanting to feel like, like knowing that it was a bad thing and like wanting to feel what that would feel like to like, instead of have mostly just very kind and sweet feelings towards us what would it feel like to like have someone not like us which is so stupid now to like wish to experience uh someone not liking you um which and is also a strange thing to, to even say um because plenty of people probably didn't like me um for various reasons but i think we tried to do this thing um, where we faked being uh, what's the word um, propositioned by ExxonMobil with an artist grant for Mellow Pages that would basically like solve all financial problems. And so there's this construction of a fake interplay between like a horrible environmental disaster of a company um, trying to like assuage some guilt through throwing money at a, a very small art. Uh, it wasn't even a nonprofit, like a cooperative, I don't know, um, project. And yeah, it like quickly became, it, like it was, I think we had just seen yes, or what is the, there's a group, there's a do, there's like two people who like do this where they infiltrate like a bad company and like 
I think it's called Think Men. Think uh, man, it was like we had just watched this documentary of these guys who had done it in a much better way, where like they had basically infiltrated like a horrible oil company and then like forced them to like make some really bad decisions financially. Anyway, we had this like theoretical backing and we thought like maybe this will get, I don't know, Exxon in trouble at the best, maybe us like a, maybe someone will really care about us and be like, no, don't take that money from these dirty hands. Like we'll give you money from our less dirty hands. Um, but yeah, like it became a, uh, it was again, another media like blip where we got a lot of praise. And I, I feel like one of the, one of the worst things was I went to molasses afterwards and uh, I still, oh man, I feel so bad about this. I went, Jake and I both went, we walked there and Matt was, was bartending um, the owner and he was, he was just so pumped. Cause I think at that point we had like furthered the story by saying that like we were gonna decline the money and we were thereby like positioning ourselves to be these darlings of, of the underdog. Um, and I remember Matt being like, I don't think he was like drinks on us for the rest of the night, but he definitely like gave us both beers. And that felt so shitty. <laughs> that felt really, really bad. Cause it was, it was taking someone's unfounded goodwill towards, towards you. Like, it was just like a lie. It was just like, um, continuing a lie. Cause at that point we were like, we gotta just keep going with this. Just gotta, I mean, I mean, that's how lies work, but, um, yeah. Oh man. I felt so shitty for taking that beer. And then later a person figured out they'd like called Exxon Mobil probably on our behalf to like kind of like egg them on or something. Uh, but a journalist person that we knew called an Exxon I don't even know how like Exxon Mobil like cared, but I think, oh, it was, I think a business insider like contacted Exxon Mobil <laughs> and, and like, Exxon was like, we've never heard of these people in our lives, which is like the perfect response. Um, yeah, and then then there's a lot of blow back and lost some friends. And I, th I feel like we lost a lot of like trust legitimately and yeah, I, I remember like when that article came out, I was working and I felt weird, weird feelings I'd never felt before. Like, um, yeah, like these big amoebas of, of weird feelings <laughs> moving through me, uh, which is exactly what I wanted is to like feel that despair. So it was a pretty bad case of, of getting what you you asked for um which was just I've, I've like talked to jacob and i have talked about it many times uh and it yeah they're interesting conversations to have because some people afterwards were like that was brilliant that was the, don't care don't worry about all these other people you're like you're still like doing this or like this that was so funny or um that was such a, I mean, it was, it was such a, like a, um, a thing that people interpreted differently. Yeah. Uh, whether it's, as like, this is stupid, what, the, like, whatever, but it doesn't hinder what you do or like, or some people were like, you personally have broken all ties with me and I'm done with you. Um, wow. Forever. Wow. <laughs> yeah, it was. It was a weird time. It felt like, yeah. 
yeah that one that one's a weird one in the life lifetime of yeah. events well for me i just i think i just kind of thought it was funny like i didn't really think that much about it uh or i, I was like oh damn they nearly had the money now they don't that sucks like but i don't know maybe because i'm not american or something like i didn't really like get it in the same way that other people were like immediately like this is bad I was like what is it what does it mean (laughs) like Mm. um but there was also like I mean I just like I don't know it seems like a interesting experiment right like there was also the time when you said you said that (laughs) Kanye West was coming (laughs) (laughs) I forgot about that oh yeah. yeah oh boy I don't yeah. even like, it was just like, oh, can, like it was like a secret email or something that was sent to people. It was like, Kanye West is coming yeah. to shoot a video tonight. Like, yeah. so like people should come if they, like at a certain time or whatever. Yeah. And then like, I remember like not thinking that Kanye was going to shoot a video. Cause this was like when you were in the small <laughs> studio. Yeah. <laughs> 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 but, but like me and Peter VD, we were together on that day we were like let's go like yeah. it doesn't matter what's going to happen really does it like Kanye's not going to be there we'd also just seen Kanye at governor's ball like a few days oh, yeah. before so we were like oh I probably will see him again <laughs> and then we <laughs> and yeah. then we um yeah then we came and like of course Kanye wasn't there and I don't think there was even like an anything happening we were just you we were just like having a party um yeah. but like that day I met like so many people that I am friends with, like I'm friends with now ever since like it was on that night when I met like a bunch of people so I don't care I'm happier that I met my friends than, me, than I had met Kanye that day yeah well I'm happy for you I I, <laughs> I, I remember you coming with Peter I remember yeah. there being like like a more people than would be normally on a Wednesday or whatever day it was. Um, I remember also like running around and like trying to communicate with Jacob because I think I had come from work or school or something. And so I came late and Jacob was like super, he was sweating. <laughs> and then we had to like, yeah, I forgot about that. We, we got a whole card stock of of jinxes it's really funny how you just like came up with these weird ideas like or lies uh, and then but they had no like end point in like you, you didn't really know what you were gonna do <laughs> yeah. yeah 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 see what happens yeah I don't know I think it's like it's your library you can do whatever you want um but I don't know like that stuff aside which i i still think is funny i don't know what other people think but um what do you what for you like what are like the high point like what are the highlights or like the things that you remember like what are the best parts about having done this um i mean meeting people like that that was the the coolest thing was like meeting you and Chris and Jordan and Peter everyone who would show up and come like having folks of various uh introvert extrovert kind of uh qualities like I I remember like Jessica coming in almost every other day and like she wouldn't come to the events or if she did it would have to be a special one, but like, I got to talk to her about books. And even though I was also like, some of the best nights were like karaoke at three in the morning. I also really just love talking to people about books and, and like, one of my favorite readings was really in the beginning um, where it was a like reader writer 
reading where um, Aidan Arda was the reader of Suzanne Scanlon. And so I don't even remember how this even worked, but like, um, and then another one of like our regulars, she was the reader of Dan Majors. And so Dan Majors and maybe that was a different night, but it was basically like Aiden loved promising women, promising young women. I don't remember the name, but a Suzanne Scanlon novel. And um, we reached, I don't even remember if like we reached out or she reached out or uh, somehow she was going to come and do a reading and we asked like if Aiden could read or maybe Aiden asked, maybe Aiden got in touch, but it was just like this very sweet and like symbolic breakdown of, of the distance between a reader and a writer and, and like both people got to read their work and also talk about each other's work and it just felt like an impossible or a seemingly um, improbable event happening like I, I i i would before new york maybe i would think like i would never like hang out or or let alone read with with someone i really admire mm -hmm. so i remember like in seattle like blake maybe off of like scorch atlas came to pilot books blake butler and and like everyone went out to a bar afterwards and i i mean i like drank a beer and like barely said anything because because there's this this like in mm -hmm. self-implied maybe just for me maybe for others but like this distance that seems like I can't bridge it because you're over here uh, an author and I'm over here this reader and um to see Aiden up there with Suzanne Scanlon was like it was so cool um yeah but then, yeah, then we then there's also like Eric Nelson's birthday party. Like that's to be able to offer that space to a friend and like have them do whatever they want with a with an evening uh, is also cool. Um, yeah. Yeah, just yeah, being around like seeing your friends read that that was cool too, like when you become uh more connected and more intimate with with the people you admire and then like like seeing you read or like seeing seeing chris read or seeing jacob read like and and then seeing other people like it's it's, a, it's unfortunate that like there's a whole system that needs to be built but to see your friend being appreciated by other people is also really cool. Like, if you come in and do a reading, I know other people that you've never met will be there in attendance and see you, and and like be hearing the same thing that I hear in probably a completely different way, but like we'll be appreciating you. And I don't know. That seems pretty special and hard, but hard to do. Like hard to provide. Like I can't just go into a city and and like unless there's a reading series and, and or there's like a, a place where there are a bunch of readings it just it seems like a hard thing to do as an outsider that that but there are also like so many readings that were on a tuesday i'm gonna just put all my pain into tuesdays there's like a two there's like if you were given a reading tuesday night or something it was probably there, I we would try our hardest, but maybe five people would show up. Yeah, that, yeah. that could be hard. Yeah, but. I remember like I would go to a bunch of readings like that, just be like, "What's happening tonight? Okay, I'll come," and then stay and watch. And like, yeah, you just like don't know what who the people are or what's going on really, but you're like, yeah, okay. But I mean, so many people, uh, like so many people who are writers and who like do readings and stuff but like I don't like readings it's so boring I don't want to go to a reading or whatever um and I don't like I kind of get that because a lot of readings are not that good but like the readings that that would be at Mellow Pages like it just uh it felt like such a comfortable place 
for for me but like for a lot of people I think like it just I felt like it was like the way that everything could be casual and sort of like informal in, in ways that it's difficult to to do like especially in New York now like maybe not I mean I'm saying now like as opposed to like in the 80s or something you know like I mean like it's so expensive like before um before Mellow, like me, like I'd done a few readings in New York and organized a few readings, but it was always like, where are we gonna do this? Like we have to like pay for some gallery and or and we don't have any money or we, it's gonna be like on a roof. Um, but you know, like, or it's gonna be in someone's basement or like, it's just like hard to, mm. to uh, you know, figure out. And then suddenly like there was this place where it'd be like, can we have a reading? And or like, can, can we do a reading? And you were like, yeah. And then after like doing like one shabby dollhouse reading at, at Mellow Pages, I was like, I don't want to do <laughs> any readings in New York, not in this place, because it's so much better. <laughs> like the idea of just like you, like, and like I would be comfortable in the, in the room. Like I would be there all day or whatever. I'd be there before. And like, I would know how everything worked. And then like, once it, uh, once it was time to, to actually have the event and everyone showed up it would just be like all right let's go like let's make this like a great thing mm -hmm. and like you could just like that couldn't happen unless it unless mm -hmm. you were in like a a room where you felt like safe and like it was okay to do whatever you were going to do um so i mean thanks <laughs> yeah i'm glad i'm glad you felt safe and comfortable that was yeah it yeah it seemed to hit that like sweet spot between like someone's basement and then like someone's parents library where like you don't feel like maybe it's a nice spot but you don't feel comfortable but at least as a bathroom whereas like if you go to a basement show right you can do whatever the fuck you want but if you have to pee you might have to go on the street and yeah and there's like that, yeah, like a couch or couches. And like, there was like a very casualness to it, but there's also, yeah, the, this is a room that really tries to highlight books and takes them seriously in some way. And you can go to the bathroom around the corner. <laughs> Which truly yeah. makes a big difference when you're organizing a oh, event. Yeah like I don't know like it it changes the whole night like people <laughs> not just not just that but like and also the fact that like you know you could get a drink really cheap and like it that was like the only thing you had to pay for at any point in the evening like it was just like this is how things should work right like it shouldn't be I don't know it shouldn't be difficult we're just all we need is a room and some people stand up and say something like mm -hmm. yeah but you need that room it... yeah you do so uh, so mellow pages like after a couple of years it was like kind of unsustainable right because it was so expensive to be in that place and the, it, the place itself didn't make money and you were both working all the time and like <laughs> um it was just like you know not possible, I guess, because, but well, what would you do if you were going to do something again like that? Like, oh, or would you, you know, like, how would you approach it differently? Um, I mean, I would, I would limit the hours. I would like definitely try to spread out the, the like, I guess make horizontal the vertical. I mean, we had people who were like ride or die and would be there to help at a moment's notice. But the, it was like that, that um, it was the noticing part where like it was on Jacob and I to make, ask, ask first for help. Um, Whereas like if we just had like a straight up like there's eight people who are responsible. Yeah. 
then there's there's no there's no need to ask in the same way it's just like um a communal effort and and even yeah so i wish i, I wish it was more communal uh i don't really know if it could have worked as a, a nonprofit in the same way because like we we're doing some dumb things in there um and we're i don't know how <laughs> we weren't kicked out of that building because we would be there very late like very very late we also locked the gate at the right time i don't know so i don't like the the like going um doing the like nonprofit straight laced route would have worked for the the pathos of of the ethos of of mellow pages but um yeah i think if i were to do it now it would, it would be very low-key like maybe a couple hours on the weekend, uh, much smaller. Um, and then like just very curated events uh, in like a backyard. But like we have, we have these friends here in Portland who have a gallery in their backyard and they do readings in the backyard and they'll do like open viewing hours on the weekend and then events on the weekends and it's it's lovely it's like that's kind of the model i see is one that's tenable but you also have to be like <laughs> very organized <laughs> you just have a lot you have to juggle a lot and uh i don't know if i want to do that juggling right now i want that community i want those people um I just don't know if I'm I'm going to be the host at this moment in my life. Mm -hmm. No, I mean no pressure. <laughs> <laughs> if you <laughs> if you want to go to Portland, we can, we can figure something out where you can, <laughs> you can have a reading. <laughs> um, yeah, but I guess like there. Are, I've just been thinking a lot lately about like what are the different ways that like an individual person can contribute like beyond their writing but maybe I guess my mind always goes towards publishing because that's like the thing that I've done is like editing people's work and publishing it on different platforms and uh like I just think it's really cool that you did this thing that is different because a lot of people just think, ah, we like books, we should make more books or something, you know, or like we, but there are all these other different ways that we can like sort of aid the culture that's like very important to us. Um, yeah, so I, I just think it's interesting. I want, I want to, I don't know. I feel like I, we could have this, we could have many more conversations on the same um, sorts of things and talk about completely different stuff. Uh, yeah, and to like speak to your point, it kind of reminds me of like when I first was like getting into zine culture, just learning about how there are zine distros who would like you would mail money. I mean, this was maybe a little bit before the internet, but with the internet too, like you would send them money and they would be the repository of all of these things instead of having, uh, if, if the person didn't live in your, in your neck of the woods, like you could go to this third party who would then connect you in, in a different, in a, in a, in a direct way. Um, right. And I think that's, yeah. I like that role. It's like not too much. It's like a momentary uh, intensity or, or focus on you. Like you can like receive and then pass <laughs> really quickly, um, which is, I think, my style. That's my speed. Yeah. Um, and I guess like 
now you're a teacher, which you weren't at the time when you were doing all this stuff. Do you feel like having been, having like been a famous librarian uh, influences you? Like, does it like affect, does it help? Does it have any effect? The first year I was teaching, I was doing, um, I was in a position through AmeriCorps. So I was, it was like, you had a stipend to live on and it was not very much. And my role was like in the school and I wasn't, I wasn't necessarily like a classroom teacher. I didn't teach a content. I had like a math support class and a reading support class. And then like a, a couple homerooms where I would just try to help people. Um, and in that situation, the, the metaphor was that like the teachers were the parents of the students and I was like an older brother. So I like, we, we would connect on a different way than they could with the regular teachers. And in that position, like having them find out about Mellow Pages was like a cool thing. Right. Um, but I also like looked younger, like more like I did uh, when I was doing Mellow Pages. And so nowadays that it doesn't matter. Like they don't care. <laughs> <laughs> and again I'm in like a different role now I'm in like a more of a parental role perhaps and like if your friend's parents like were in the Rolling Stones or something mm. <laughs> it'd be like oh cool I guess this is from the seven I mean it's so it's like long for them that was right they were they were they were young uh, right yeah, yeah so it's yeah. like who, who cares about that time time is so alien or 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 separate from my lived experiences I'm mm. pretending to be a youth right now but like they don't they might not even care about the New York Times in the same way like I think right uh media itself has changed in that time where like to yeah. have a, a byline in in the physical paper doesn't like who, who cares like that mm -hmm. and and then so much of it was just New York based that they don't they don't care right and that's nice. Yeah. It's kind of nice to be um, on a on a on the same mountain, but on a lower a lower trail again, maybe. Uh, yeah. Back in the woods a little bit instead of on that summit in the ice and snow. Uh, <laughs> uh, I don't know. Yeah, but, but teaching, they don't they don't care. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> well, that's, yeah, that's probably good. Um, well, would you like to read something? Yeah. Um, what, what are you going to read? Uh, I'm going to read a poem that I wrote for Emily uh, earlier, like a few weeks ago, I think. And it's called I know I had like that whole spiel about like not being a poet at the very beginning, but it's, poetry seems to be the way that I'm existing. Uh, it's called partial rather than partial. The total amount of days walked ends up being close to a year. If we take close to a year to be anything more than one, I'd take you close now, if at all possible. A mile down this moonlight, we woke up every day in a bed. The morning asked to be let into. We wake up alone behind a boat traveling away from the water's lip. Liberty shot himself because he dressed up as a man, dude. I'd rather display my rejection of neutrality from below than make a hat because I'm not really sure where to start. Have you ever seen a desert rose? Have you yet destroyed your expectation? Don't drink juice before sleeping. It does not bring you back. I clicked repeat. The sound was there. I'm just dying to be living with you. I'm just running down the track I can't forget. 
the end. <laughs> this is what we do in the poetry book club to anyone who doesn't know. <laughs> um, oh, it's great. Thank you so much. Um, I uh, feel like I would like to do this again sometime, maybe if you're down. I feel like I have many more things to say, but we can't just talk it forever. <laughs> um yeah so yeah um but for now thank you for this profound experience of poetry thank you lucy